All right, they're getting in here. They're getting in here, Mr. Campbell. They're coming on in. You got to give people what they want, man. You got to give people a little bit what they need. Absolutely. Absolutely. After a great win, man, it was a great weekend. We got to see some football, man. It's, it is always good when you get to see a little football. I'm about to get one of them fancy mic setups like you and Scotty got. <laughs> Radio mic, boy. Hey, what's up there, Mr. Campbell? How you doing today? Hey, man, we are here, and as long as we're here, we're doing all right. Absolutely, man. We had a we had a great weekend, man. I got a chance to. We both got it. First off, I got a chance to go out to Atlanta and uh, hang out with you a little bit, and then we went over to the great state of Alabama and to see some football, man, it was a it was a great weekend. It was a great time, Coach, and uh, I mean, Mr. Campbell, and it was a uh, it was just a really really a good time. Uh, we we discussed, and we also got a chance to live broadcast on location, and uh, I really got a big kick out of that, man. I hope you guys got a big kick out of it as well. It was a it was a great experience uh, for me to meet all the people at Alabama State. And uh, it was just a, it was just a great experience, and uh, we got a chance to uh, visit that wonderful facility out there. Man, um, you know, go ahead. So, yeah, you know, I was just gonna say, you know, as somebody who is a lover of HBCUs, has followed HBCU football for forty plus years, you know, I, the one thing I always enjoy is the pride everybody has in their school. That that is the thing that I love, and I also love. When they let you know they have pride because everybody know I came down there, you know, best to have a little fun. I wore my, you know, rattler gear down there. But everybody was so hospitable to us. Those horns looked like they're ready to go. But, Rocky, we did meet somebody that made me a bet. That Absolutely. made me a bet. <laughs> now, Rocky, now, Rocky, why don't you tell the people who, who made a bet with me well, and, and, what, and, what, and what he wanted? Yeah. Well, the AD – uh, of Alabama State University, AD Cable, uh, made a bet, made a beverage bet, not a money bet. So, you're, yeah, so yeah, you guys, yeah, just know, beverage, just a beverage bet, and uh, uh, with Mr. Campbell, he he's quite com and he's quite confident because he went in for one of the one of the fine beverages. Uh, uh, you know, it's a Balvini. 14 year Caribbean cast. So it's a, it, hey, he wasn't, he wasn't skipping on the bet. He got a lot of confidence. That, that, in, that, that in, was a lot of confidence. The brother, the brother came out. The brother didn't go low shelf, did he? Brother went top shelf real quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, see, I'm going to tell people now, see what the AD doesn't know that I am undefeated in my bets. And this goes through multiple schools and multiple years. So I hope he knows. Because we had somebody, and I ain't going to say his name, played at Prairie View, coach at the Rams now. They still ain't paying my bet because we beat his team, but I ain't going to say his name. But I just want the AD to know that I want AD Cable to make sure when we come respectfully to his house on homecoming and win, I need to have my bottle ready in the nest. I want a VIP section, Rocky. <laughs> You want bottle service? I want bottle service in the nest. <laughs> I don't want to pay for the orange juice. I don't want to pay for the pineapple juice. I want the seats. And I want that corn. You know that one right by the DJ, that nice booth. You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh, the booth. Oh, yeah. I, want the, I don't want no table now. We, we don't want no, no, no. It's bottle service at a booth. We don't do no table. In other words, you want a section. I want a section. <laughs> I want a section. Because you yeah. know, I probably bring... See, cause, cause you know now I'm gonna have to bring thick thirty six, thick forty five. I might even go down, you know, a little bit young, get thick twenty eight, and and, and no brain. So we just sit in the section. So we can just sit in the section. So you know, I, I just think that you know, uh, I, you know, okay, DK, we just gonna watch what you ask for when you, you bet me now. Just let it know. So I just want to <laughs> walk people through the experience we had at Alabama and because again, 
this is my this was my first not only my first visit it wasn't my first visit to a HBCU stadium but it was my first visit to a stadium as a member of the press you know what I mean all the other times I had to buy a ticket and and and, and go to my seat and everything like that but this time I was a member we were members of the press we were part of the cadre of media personnel that was that covered the game and so we get there, we get there, and we walk right in with, with Coach Campbell, and we see the chief of staff, Terry Sims, somebody you recognized right away as the former head coach of Bethune Cook. And he 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 let us know that he knew who he was, and he immediately expeditiously, expeditiously gave us media passes, which gave us Feel access to the players that were warming up. I really like that. We we didn't have to pull out IDs. We didn't have to do it. They they came. He spoke to. I see you guys are with HBCU coaches corner. Here are your media pass that give you feel access. I really like that. How did you like that, Mister Campbell? You know, you know. But see, uh, look, well, first of all, I think it's because we had those matching shirts. Shout out to Rocket's wife with the matching shirts, the, the matching polos. See, Rocky, you might need to pull that out from the back. Let the folks see that again. You know, I might have to go upstairs and pull that out. But I think what it was because we were, you know, coordinated. We were coordinated. We looked professional. See, for all you young folks, when you're going out there in them job interviews, you got to look prepared and coordinated. So we were prepared and coordinated. So I think that just started off the day. You know, Coach Sims, great coach. Now, Mathieu couldn't get family out of hell when he was coaching down there. So, like I said, I'm glad he's gone. But, you know, wish him well in his new position at Alabama State. But, you know, very, again, once again, all the coaches, very respectful, greet us very warmly. You know, again, like you said, gave us pass, gave us access. So, again, I was super excited about that. Again, like I said, I've been around a lot of these universities. I've met a lot of these coaches over my years. And just like I say, once again, it is a family feeling no matter what. You know what I mean? They, they don't feel untouchable, which is always what I love about these coaches that are on our level. Yeah, and, and 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 once we got the passes, we went down on the we went directly to the field and we, we got a chance to see uh first of all, uh Andrew Body as we were walking down, he was coming back up to get to, I guess to get dressed. And we noticed right away when we saw Andrew, he's a bigger man than he was before. <laughs> Believe it. Believe it. Believe it. Because oh. <laughs> I physically saw Andrew um, last summer when he came to Atlanta for the uh, HBC quarterback camp. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that young man, and it looks like he put on a good 15 to 20 pounds of muscle. And yeah. clearly, you know, and, and we'll talk a little bit about the game, but clearly he showed that arm strength in the game. So, you know, I'm really excited. And that's it, you know, I'm, and I'm going to have to look up and see who is the strength and conditioning coach down at Alabama State. Because if he's bulking up quarterbacks like that, and getting them ready. I can only imagine what that offensive defense line is going to look like. Absolutely. And then we got it there, and we, we were able to see some other players. But I, I'll tell you this, man. Uh, while, uh, the field view of the players while they were warming up before they had the helmet and the shoulder pad, <coughs> you really get a good look at how well-conditioned athletes are in that situation. And I will say, um, Alabama State has some good-looking athletes, man. They look like um, – they look like they've been well conditioned, and and it looks like the the hard work has really paid off on those guys. Because a lot of those, a few of those guys, look like Division One foot, Division One or uh, Power Five football players. When you look at just height and size, they look like, especially when you look at those DBs that they have. <laughs> they look like no joke, no joke. They look like Power Five DBs. Well, I think, once again, I think this is just what you're going to see all across the board of the top teams. They're recruiting better players, players that had, that have transferred in. Again, our power five players, group of five players. So, again, the talent itself is just being up. And you see the physical talent. You see the kids being bigger. You see the kids being stronger and things like that. So that bodes well, again, for these a lot of these kids that are transferring into HBCUs to give them an opportunity to play and shine. So, again, I'm really excited about that. But to your point, when the guys were like, oh, that, that's a DB, and you think this guy's a linebacker. And they were like, yeah, that guy's one of our DBs. I was like, wow, that's pretty impressive. So, and again, Alabama State, I think they understand what their mission is. 
they will be one of the favorites to win the SWAC. Um, I think they also understand that there's going to be a lot of pressure that comes with that. But to to the best thing to do when you have to face that pressure, you got to be prepared. And what I like and what I'm seeing, just again, to your point in the weight room, that means they're trying to get prepared for a season, a championship season. Yeah. Um, you know, when we, like I say, we were on the field and we got a chance to speak to a lot of the coaches, a few of the coaches that were on the field as the guys were warming up. And you could feel the excitement amongst the coaches that they really believe that they have some something there. They're really happy with their, you know, whether it was the DB coach, the, the, the you know, office coordinator, uh, the D-line coach. They're really happy with what they have uh, in players. And you could tell by the excitement and enthusiasm just from the coaches, uh, you know, with the guys on the field. Yeah, I think, again, when you've been building a program like Coach Robinson has, and again, you, and again, unfortunately, this is when we used to say that three-year mark. Wait until year three. That's when I've gotten my players in. That's when I've changed the culture. That's when everybody knows what we're trying to do. And Coach Robson, this is where he's at, and that, and that right there in that sweet spot. So again, that three, four-year mark, this is where he's at. So now it's time to you know show up. And I think they really got the program going in the right direction. I think everybody is really enthusiastic. Again. Again, the facilities look great. And I, what I'm really excited about is when the season starts. Because the one thing about it is we're going to see really quickly what this team looks like because they play North Carolina Central in Miami. And I'm hoping nothing changes that that game will be on the um, ESPN or ABC like it's been by ESPN like it was before. I hope that doesn't, you know, move to ESPN 3 or anything. So they have that showcase game that everybody can watch and we really can see what they can do on a um, big national wide platform. Yeah, and, and from on the field, um, you know, we stood around maybe, I mean, maybe, you know, 35, 40 minutes, maybe even an hour. We were down there on the field, and then we uh, went upstairs to kind of figure out, kind of recon where we're going to set up. And we want, and we met a, a a guy who's associate AD, and I want to shout him out, uh, Coach Keith McClooney. I think that's his name if I got it wrong. Mm, Keith McClooney. Was ve- Keith. Keith was extremely helpful in connecting us with uh, Mr. Singleton and and uh, and getting us set up so we could go live right there on the porch, what, what it looks like. And we were able to go live before the game and even during the game uh, for a bit right there on the porch. We had uh, the Q Dogs and, uh, 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 you know, they were there being our bodyguards, making sure people stayed away from us. And they also got some camera time themselves. That was really cool to see those guys come on and talk about this pride in their school and their fraternity. That was, that was a really cool experience. Um, and, and, you know, and again, we'll talk about the game, um, you know, uh, here soon. Um, and then just the, and then, but up there, we, on the floor, we, it was just all ball on the, on the field. But when we got up on the porch or on the concourse, as, as uh, people would say, we got a feeling for the fans and the people and the environment of what what the event was all about, man. And coach, I mean, Mr. Campbell, if I had not known it was a spring game, just by the what they put into the spring game, it looked like game day, didn't you think? Yeah. See, this is what I like. What Alabama State did, and shout out to Ezra Kelly, one of my favorite HBCU players. I see him in the chat. I gotta get that young brother. That brother's amazing. You know, just a great young man for everything I saw and heard about him. So I just want to shout that young brother out. But the thing about it, what I like, is that as they say, they start them off young. They had activities for the your youngsters. They had they were um, promoting the Orange Blossom Classic to the alumni. Hey, let's make sure you come down to Miami, get all the information that you need. And then I believe they also it was a high school band day. I believe that's why we had like nine hundred people in the band. So just again to give those young people a feel of what it feels like to sit in an HBCU stand and play with an HBCU band. I mean, it was just an incredible environment. It was something that again is just something that we just do it different. We just do it different. And, I, and I'm always proud to, when I see that. So, yeah, man, it, it, it was a great feeling. It was, you know, it was a great day. It wasn't just like, oh, we're going to have a spring game and you guys just sit in the stands and, you know what, leave and go home. All right. Well, uh, Mr. Campbell, like, I mean, like we always do on HBCU Coast and Corner, you never know who might show up. And no, Coach Cole is running just a little late. We got a coach that can 
stand in his place, and, and I think this particular coach can really hold his own. And we'd like, we like to give an amazing welcome to the head coach of Alabama State University, none other than swag legend Eddie Robinson. Good evening. How's it going? Young, young, How's young Eddie Robinson. Yeah, the, the young Eddie Robinson, not the you know you you. I'm I'm the, the second, not not the not the original legend. Yeah, that, that he's he was a great man. A absolutely, uh, Coach Robinson. I want to again thank you and your your staff and 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 the whole uh the whole administration at Alabama State how they welcomed us and gave us access. We also uh, want to personally thank you for for giving us the opportunity to take part in the uh, festivities that was going on uh, in the nest. We certainly appreciated, appreciated that, man. That is a, a wonderful facility there, Coach. And I wanted to personally thank you because you, you're the one that, that uh, suggested that we go over there and gave us access to the festivities that were happening over there. That was certainly unplanned, but a very pleasant, pleasant, pleasant supply, surprise. So- Yeah, so, I mean, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. So, Coach Rob, let me ask let me ask you this: What were your impressions of the spring game as a whole? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, um, the the spring game you you, you can't never lose because you're playing each other. The problem is you can never win either. So, uh, you know, you, you you see a big play on offense, and then you're looking at, oh, man, why the cornerback gave up that touchdown? So, uh, you know, for us, the biggest thing out of it is get everybody healthy. Uh, you want to see who can make plays. You know, so we kept it pretty vanilla. And, uh, you know, football is all about blocking and tackling. So you just want to see who can go out there, execute the offense, execute the defense. We saw a lot of young guys that played, uh, ran the ball well, and uh, got some young guys in that secondary that, that stepped up. And some offensive linemen who didn't play a lot last year, and they got a chance to get a lot of reps in, you know, 50, 40 or 50 plays. So uh, you're trying to see, hey, can I, can I count on this guy for 10 plays, 20 plays, or can he give me a whole game? So – uh, we figured that out about a couple of guys over the spring break. I mean, over the spring uh, training, and now we'll get back into the into the uh, summer aspect of it and, and try to get bigger and stronger and get ready for the season. Uh, Coach Robin, when you, um, I saw I, you know, I actually loved the way you started off the spring game. Spring game. I won't get into specifics. You guys didn't film it, so I'm sure you guys don't want to. We don't want to talk schematics here. But I'll just uh, say this: you made the first maybe five, ten plays were about physicality on the field. Is that a philosophy of yours that you believe in or, or you know, or we, what were you trying to get done by, 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 in my opinion, emphasizing physicality? Yeah, man, it, it has to be, you know, football is a, you know, it's, it's a tough sport uh, played by, by some grown men and, and some young kids here who are trying to make it to that next level and, and get to that area. So some young adults. And at the end of the day, uh, you, you got to block and tackle and you got to be physical. And we, we emphasize it. We preach it every day. Uh, usually, if you're the most physical team on the field, don't create a lot of penalties or turnovers. You got a great chance of winning a football game. So that's the games that we've played in, played well in, the games that we've won. We were the most physical team. And I say, uh, and when we have that motto, it, you know, it starts with defense. And those guys have been been that way for the last couple of years. So now the offense is starting to fight back. And then you saw that from our offensive line. They came out and the all, all, all summer, I mean, all spring, they've just been playing with a chip on their shoulders. And so that's what we're trying to get to. Uh, the guys in the trenches really determine what goes on. We know the, you know, the, the guys that are that catching the golf, catching the ball, scoring the touchdowns, et cetera, et cetera. They get their name in the paper, but in, in the end of the day, uh, the offensive line, defensive line, that's when it's a man against man testing each other's will and seeing just how physical you can be. And that's that's what we really want to establish on both sides of the ball. Where we saw what you were able to get in, uh, get done on the field, uh, and you could talk about whatever aspects of it you choose, but I wanted to ask you, were you, able, were you guys able to get out of the game healthy as you would like to? Yeah, that was the big thing. I mean, the whole spring, you know, it's a fine line between, you know, did we tackle enough? Did we hit enough? But at the same time, you know, we eased up on that aspect of it to not get people injured. And so um, that's a big part of it. So from an injury standpoint, we were pretty good. You know, we didn't have anybody, you know, get too banged up and stuff like that. And I think we got in a fair amount of of tackling during the, during the spring and in the spring game. Uh, got about a good 80 plays, which was pretty good. 
And uh, guys kind of got some high rep counts, guys who didn't play in that many plays last year. So now I'm trying to figure out you know, how many plays can I trust you for? You know, can I get 30, 40? Can I get a whole game out? Of you? Can I get a season out? Of you? And that's what I try to tell the guys. Like, hey, what's your breaking point? How many plays can you go before you make a mistake, before you jump offside? You know, before you before you crack. And so your opponent has to crack before you do. And that's what we're trying to push each other to that breaking point to see where it's at. And so we have to know that now. So um, accomplished a lot. I feel like we moved in the right direction, uh, got a whole lot more work to do. Uh, we cut down the penalties. We didn't have uh, but a couple offsides in the, in the spring game, which was good. Uh, some scrimmages, we had quite a few. So those are things that we're trying to do. Uh, play error free, fo pre free football, you know, try to play the perfect game. And that's what you got to keep working towards. Coach, I wanted to ask you a question. We all see a spring game where we see the players. But a spring game and spring practice is also for the coaches. Yeah. So we know that you, you know, you've got a new offensive staff, great offensive coaches and things that have now come in. What did you want to see the new staff do during the spring game and, and during this run up to the spring game? Yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, you know, we put the headsets on for the first time as coaches. And so uh, all the offensive guys, the guys that are going to be assigned to the boot, you know, we want to see how that works out. This was the first time that whole offensive staff was together. Uh, they're learning my coaching style. I'm listening on the headsets. So I know when to interrupt, you know, what's the play and, and giving my coaching points in it, uh, got into the timeout. So instead of having three or four coaches screaming at the same time, I'm real big on one voice. You know, if you have three kids telling the quarterback to do something, he's looking like, ah, uh, you know what I'm saying? So you have to have one voice, whether it's right or wrong, just one voice talking at a time. And it seems like a small thing, but uh once the staff kind of gets together to a couple games, you kind of know that. So we'll we'll replicate the same thing in the fall. We'll pull out the headsets out for at least two or three more times, hoping that when we get into the first game, you know, we're ready to go. We're ready to rock and roll. But when you have a new staff, that's a big part of it. Uh, the defensive and, and my equipment managers, they were working out, too, because my defensive headsets wasn't working. Uh, you know, in the spring game, it's not that big a deal. But in the real game, you know, we would have been going ballistic. So that means, hey, Get out here a little earlier, double check it, make sure it's worse. So it's really a dress rehearsal for everybody. The fans are up there, you know, eating popcorn, having a great time. But for us, you know, we're in game mode saying, hey, this is almost like a preseason contest for us where we're trying to react. And, I mean, trying to you know, get a get a dress rehearsal for everything that we'll have to do when the, when the bullets start flying. Hey, Co Coach, I, I want to ask you this. Was there any group that you went into the uh, – game kind of concerned about what you had and then that got kind of got cleared up in the spring game um i would say we have a lot of young wide receivers you know it's probably probably the most talented group on the team on the field from top to bottom but they're unproven you know Keyshawn johnson our, our leading receiver last year led the swag in receptions all conference guy um so he transferred to another school so now we have a lot of young guys who have to step up and some of those guys made some plays uh, we know they have the talent, but at the end of the day, uh, when you're talking about this, you, you got three catches in your SWAC career, you know, they don't have any SWAC hours. So we got to see what those guys can do. And uh, But the good thing is they have a really good defense to practice against. So I feel I think they'll be fine, but it's just a matter of, you know, can they do it in a game-like setting so we can get on the same page and trust them that they can have confidence in themselves to know, hey, I'm a college player and I can compete in this conference. And And let me ask you this. I mentioned at the beginning that you, you, uh, it was it was a physical battle early in the, in the spring game, but when you decided to air it out, uh, there was some success there, coach. Was that something that you expected, uh, from your offense, considering in the past years, to just be perfectly honest, um, you, at times you got struggled to to, to pass the ball. Um, were you expecting to see what you saw in the spring game? Yeah, I mean, we've been we've been having success uh, in practice doing that, and so it's, it's not like we don't practice passing. So it's just, <laughs> you know, so and sometimes it just it may look like we don't practice it as, as the game as the game goes on. But trust me, we practice it, and we understand. You know, you have to have the big chunk plays. So that that has to. It was a point of emphasis the last year. Uh, we made some big plays like that, but now we we know. Um, as, as much as I talk about physicality and establishing the line of scrimmage, and end of the day, it's hard to run the ball 12 straight times and score a touchdown. You know, too many bad things can happen. So you have to have that 40 yard play, and then you can finish off and get back to what you want to do. So we know for us to be a successful team and have an explosive offense, we want a ball control bet. You have to have those guys who can make a play 
And uh, we had a couple young kids, you know, it was a, you know, five yard rocket screen and they made a person miss and turned it into a 20 yard play. And it was just a one on one play. So we have to look at those guys that are playmakers, you know, those wide receivers, the run after the catch has to be big and and we can get the ball to them. But it, it, you can't you can't let one guy tackle you in open open space consistently if you want to be a big time player. So those are the type of guys that we're looking for, the guys that can make plays once they have the ball in their hand. All right, coach. <clears throat> I, you know, I'm going to ask the obvious question. We have a lot of, a lot of comments. A lot of people ask this question. How do you feel about your quarterback position now versus how you felt about it at the end of last year's season? Well, I mean, at the, at the end of last year, um, you know, we, we had a kid that played really well for us you know, and Stu. So we, we felt pretty good about it, you know, going down the stretch, you know, he really turned the corner, uh, you know, as, as the transfer portal, you know, the, the portal gives it and the portal takes it away, as they say. So uh, it's, it's just part of college football. You can you can get upset about it or you can adapt to it. So we we're going to choose to adapt to it. And so, um, you know, now, you know, with Andrew Body, I mean, he's a guy that that I've admired as a player, you know, watched him since he was a freshman at Texas Southern. And uh, he's competed in this conference. So he knows the conference. Uh, just a great kid all around. Great family uh, leader on and off the field. And uh, he can make plays. I mean, it's a guy that can that can run really well, still has the, the arm strength, still can make plays. You know, he's he's healed up from the shoulder surgery and all. So I'm I'm just excited about him. He's excited about it. So uh, I think he's the guy that can really take us to where we want to go. And, uh, you know, you always have those guys that, that when things didn't go exactly the way they wanted, they have that chip on the shoulder. And I think he's that type of guy. You know, he's he's playing with a grudge and he wants to, wants to get there and, and get to a championship. And everybody's trying to compete and practice and play everything we do. We're trying to do it at a championship level. So he fits the mold and uh, just a kid that really makes everybody better. So um, a guy that we really can kind of rally behind and he made some really good plays for us in the spring game. Coach, I want to ask you a question and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to something at the end before we end this interview. Cause I, like I said, again, you're one of my 88 brothers. I've known about your career for a long time. Like I said, I'm very proud of my 88 brothers. So you know what that means. Oh, yeah. you on brother Martin, but I want to yeah. want to talk about something that I, I want to ask you about. You have a, looks like a younger coaching staff and things like that. What are you telling these guys? Because coach, you you got a bullseye on you, and you kind of remind me of Coach Simmons last year, where mm -hmm. and I, and me being a FAMU guy, there was the celebration bowl that we didn't want to hear anything a celebration bowl of bust. And now you have built this team, you've got this talent. What are you telling your coaches? What are you telling your players to keep as they say keep the main thing the main thing. Not try to win the Celebration Bowl in April, but understand that this is a process to get to where we're trying to go, which is to be in Atlanta. Yeah, so that, that's a great that's a great point. And so uh, last year, you know, we started off one and three. And uh, last year we were, you know, hey, we got a big game going to FAMU. We have a big game going to Jackson State homecoming. We have a huge Mad City Classic. And I think we were kind of, you know, looking down the road. You know, we played well against Southern a tough game at home and then we come back and we lose the miles. And so, um, you know, I, I think after that fam, you lost and then we, we played great against all corn. We did everything but win the game. That's football. You know, sometimes it happens like that. Uh, Rush for a whole bunch of yards. All the stats say we should have won, but we didn't. So what should have happened, happened. So sitting there at one and three, uh, my defensive coordinator, Ryan Williams, he's like, hey, man, we just need to win today. You know what I'm saying? So that, and we kind of took that model of let's stop worrying about winning the championship. Uh, you know, a lot of things would have to go right for us to win a championship at this point. But what we can do is win today. And so, uh, you know, what I did was, you know, you always talk about product placement. So above our elevator, when you walk in into our uh, building, it says win today. So it's the first thing that all the guys see. So now this year we're just saying, hey, we we know that our goal is to get to the Celebration Bowl and win it. We know our goal is to win a SWAC championship. But, but realistically, our goal is to win today. And so if we can win each day, if we can win Tuesday, win Wednesday, you know, win the spring game, come back, win the next day. And that might be an academic day. It may be a day in the weight room. You know, it may be a day of rest and recovery. And so whatever it is, you have to win each day. And if, if you win each day, then it'll get you where you have an opportunity to be great when the, when the chance comes. And so uh, we just have to kind of you know, in the back of our mind, we're still thinking, hey, we want to win the celebration bowl. But at the end of the day, if, if you don't win each day and don't win the first game, the second game, that celebration bowl had never happened. So I think uh, you know, it was a humbling experience starting off the season one and three. And uh, you kind of figure like, man, what happened? You know, so we didn't, especially after you win, you know, beat a team like Southern, who was a good team at home. You're just thinking like, here we go. And then we kind of sputtered. 
And so uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we can get off to a great start this year. But at the end of the day, if we can win each day, I think it puts us in the right mindset. That is awesome, Coach. That is awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. Hey, we got Coach Cole on. Coach Ola, Cole has been able to jump on with us now. He's en route to somewhere. How you doing, Coach Cole? Man, I'm doing wonderful, man. I just got through coaching my my uh, elementary school team. Of course, we was victorious. You know, I got that itch, man. You know, so, uh, hey, they taught me back into it, Eddie. You know, they, they, they kept asking me. So I went on. We, we won, what, what, 29 to 12 today. So I'm feeling good. So what you what you got the hobo offense working again? Hey, look, hey, but hey, it's in basketball now. Um, oh, basketball. Okay, basketball. okay. But hey, man, <laughs> at first I want to thank you and your staff and Jason and, and, and Alabama State Hornet football program, man. I mean, you guys were first class. Y'all treated us with first class, and uh, this just the beginning of what we want to do on the HBCU coaches corner, man. Is just to express and let people see black college programs. You know, we get that bad, that bad uh, 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 taste about people talking about our program. And, and Eddie, you know, you, you, you're an HBCU guy, you're a SWAT guy. You know, we always get the bad end of the stick. But uh, y'all program is, is, is great. I know you're moving in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and, I, and I appreciate you guys coming out there because, you know, we have to celebrate our kids. We got to celebrate our universities. You know, like like any school, like any conference, we're going to make some mistakes and people always talk about that. But when we're doing something well, uh, we have to celebrate that and point that out, too. So I, I appreciate you guys coming out and giving us the coverage. No, well, no. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm way early. I got I got y'all winning it, winning the uh, East, baby. All right, man. I like that. Let's let hey, let's let's make it happen. So uh, that's our that's our goal. And so I, I, you know, you'll be a part of it, man. You still you still a hornet deep down inside, even though you got that Texas Southern degree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, Coach, Coach Robinson. We've had yes, so much so much interest about the spring game. Of course, you know we were there. We broadcasted live from location, but we weren't able to show any footage from the spring game. A lot of people wanted to see the spring game and wanted to watch it. Can you tell the f- philosophy of not streaming the spring, st- the streaming the spring game, and why you go, why you guys chose not to broadcast it? Yeah, well, probably we. It was, really was a decision right before the game. I think uh, Coach Sims, the defensive uh, uh, DFO, uh, football ops guy, he was like, "Hey, man, uh, you, you want him to." to broadcast the game. And I was like, I thought they were doing interviews you know, with, with Coach Penny, our volleyball coach and athletic director. And so they already had it set up. It was a good backdrop. I was like, nah, just let them do the interviews. And so we have a we have a lot of great coaches. Coach Bean who's won over 50 SWAC indoor and outdoor track championships, uh, cross country, everything. So I thought it was a great time for those guys to be on the Hornet Network, or the Hornet Sports Network. And uh, trust me, football team you know, we have a lot of games. We have 12 games this year, hopefully a 13 and a 14 game. So um, I feel like it was just a good chance to let all of those guys, you know, kind of talk about their programs and all the success they've been having. And, Coach, you guys have a top-notch facility. The game day environment in the event was amazing. Uh, I'm so glad that we were able to come to the game and just experience it. And you guys did a good job, did a good job creating almost a game day experience for a spring game, that was incredible. Well, was that purposeful, or or, or were you? Well, what well, let me say, was that what you wanted to have on uh, the spring game? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the marching hornets they came out, the band was there. They were they were extremely loud. So it, it uh, you know, usually they get the they'll stop playing when we're on offense. So it, it made us use some signals, which was good. Uh, for our quarterbacks to kind of get in the, the habit of that. And so, uh, we know, a marching band has to be a part of the HBCU experience. But, but yeah, I mean, we wanted it to be as much of a game day as possible. We had a really good crowd. Had around 200-plus um, kids there for our junior day. So that was really big. Wow. Uh, it had some campus connection events come on. So usually the, 
the whole university kind of pulls into to make it that type of atmosphere. And, and also the Orange Blossom Classic. I mean, they did a great job of coming out and having like a tailgate type deal with the food trucks and everything else. So they participated. And of course, we're playing in that first game against North Carolina Central. And so they did a good job of doing free ticket giveaways and everything like that. So that really just in, enhanced everything that we were trying to do. And, and keep in mind, we had a couple, we had like four or five freshmen, some transfer kids. That was their first time really being in the stadium because we don't practice there. So I think you know getting that dress rehearsal for them. So when that first home game comes, they're not like, oh wow, what's going on? So it was pretty cool. Yeah. And hey, coach, you going into your third year, third year, man. And uh, I want to say that that of course you was an academia, and you could tell that you have, have gotten better as a head coach every year, every year. The moves that you make. I think you make great moves. I think, you know, of course, you've learned as a head coach, you got to make hard decisions as well. You know, where do you think that you're at with this group? You know, your third year, of course, you switch your offense out. I think, you know, where do you think you're at as as the coaching staff? I know you could, your hard coach, uh, uh, Simmons, that, I mean, from uh, from Bethune-Cookman, where do you think you're at as far as a, a – organization in a group yeah I, mean, I think uh you know getting that right and i know the, the first year i was like you know I was talking to some of my mentors you know coach uh henry frazier and those guys and just saying hey man i think i got a great staff he said hey man you're gonna have to make some changes after the first year i was like nah coach i'm i'm good we good <laughs> so and then sure enough i had to make some changes after the first year <laughs> so uh, so you know one thing about it you know I'm smart enough to know that I'm not the smartest man in the room. So I, I try to I try to make sure I have coach and mentors. I mean, coach, I've I've talked to you also, like, hey man, which this is where I'm at. You know, it's a tough decision. I talked to Coach Barlow and I, I reached out to a lot of guys. You know, one thing about it, um, you know, football is football, and but it's always different scenarios, different situations that can't happen. So you're trying to get input. I mean, you have to, you know, ultimately I have to make the decision, but you try to get as much information as you can so you can make the best de the best decision with the information that you have. So I think moving forward this year, just looking at the guys that we have in the room, uh, the way it's kind of connecting and bonding, it just seems really natural. Uh, you know, Coach Glover, our, our wide receiver coach, came over from Georgia Tech, but he had coached at Bethune-Cookman with my defensive coordinator, Ryan, and also he coached with Coach Sim. So it was, it was kind of guy that kind of fit into what we were doing. Uh, Coach Barnett, you know, I, I watched his offense a lot. My son originally started off at North Carolina a t so I remember watching him in, you know, 17, 18, 19 with the offense. So I was real familiar with what he was doing. And so, uh, you know, bringing him on board was kind of like the guy that I was familiar with, so it was kind of easy. And then Coach Carr, you know, our offensive line coach, he was a former student athlete at Alabama State. And so I, I knew him from a long time. He came over from Clark, Atlanta. So all of the new guys just kind of fit into to the existing staff. And then uh, Coach Ronnie Scott, you know, he was a guy that played here, was a Magic City Classic MVP defensive back, uh, was a GA here and then left for two years. Now he's coming back as my safeties coach. So it's kind of like he's coming back home. Everybody already knew him on the staff. And uh, that staff continuity, man, it's, it's really huge because the players are watching us every day. They're watching the way we interact. And if we don't genuinely like each other and get along, then the vibe is off in the room. It's, it's kind of like when, when your mom and daddy arguing, you know, something just ain't right in the house. Your sisters and brothers, then y'all gonna start arguing too. So it is, everybody has to be on the same page. And I think that's a big deal. And uh, something that I realize that is important because we're we're together, you know, man, six, seven months straight, you know, for every day. You know, we may get a day off here or there, but for the most part, we're seeing each other every day. So you got to have guys that's going to show up with a great attitude and have a lot of effort every day. So oh, that's good. That, that's awesome, Coach. Um. <clears throat> So would you say you're happy with where your program is right now in, in your third year? I mean, I think we're trending in the right direction. This is To me, this is a pivotal year. Uh, you know, we have a couple of our young guys that are moving up that, that first class. Uh, second class is a little bit better. I think this class is even better. Uh, got a good mix of portal kids. And, and uh, I mean, we'll see. I mean, we, we're going to work at a level that we, we that we hope is a championship level, but every other coach in the conference is, is doing the same thing. So everybody's trying to get better. That's that's what's so funny about it. Your team build, you bond, you improve your players, they work hard. And then the, the, the best part about it, you go out there and you see, hey, did I do enough? You know, you go out there, you know, week one and, and you hope is enough. And if it's not, hey, you correct it and uh, you try to get better each week so you can start playing championship football. 
But I, I like where we are. I think we're trending in the right direction. I uh, love the attitudes in the building. You know, I love going to work. I love um, having the guys talking to the kids. You know, uh, it, it's not a day that I don't do something to help Alabama State football win. Like every day I tell the kids, you can call me any day of the week. You know, I got the same phone number and same AOL email for 30 years. So they they know how to get a hold of me. And so uh, but I love talking to them. Like every day is it's a different experience. I think that's the funnest part about the job. It never gets boring because I, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow when I go in the building. So. Hey, coach, I'm one, I know we, we want to close this out, but I, I've got to give you your flowers. And I want to say something and I want you to just talk to the people out there. You were a two time swag defensive player of the year a two-time All-American, an academic All-American, and an NFL player. And you also play as a fraternity. Dude, tell me how you talk to your players about being an all-around. You were the true definition of what student athlete was. And I think a lot of people have seen your NFL career, but the outstanding man that you are. And what do you tell your players? Because you, you really are a role model. So what would you tell those young people about going to an HBCU and achieving all that you've achieved and not being the coach at Alabama State? Well, you know, it, it, a lot of that goes back to Coach Markham. You know, I, I remember at his funeral, he talked about, his wife talked about, should I say, about how he wanted to make an impact, you know, how he made an impact on kids' lives. And so my my job right now, yeah, we're trying to win championships. You know, we all, we all want that. All coaches want that. But then today, I'm trying to make an impact on coaches, on kids' lives. You know, I'm trying to I'm trying to make them say, if not for Alabama State, then where would I be? Because that's what I can say. You know, coming here as an 18, fresh, 18 year old freshman, as a walk on, you know, I had these goals and dreams, and this was what I was expecting to happen that I hoped happened. But, you know, it was a whole lot of people that, uh, that kind of helped me to get here. And, uh, you know, just a, a whole lot of love for the conference. You know, I think one of my best moments of playing SWAT football, we played in the Heritage Bowl against North Carolina AT. Uh, and Cornell Maynard, he was the quarterback. And of course, we had Ricky Jones. And for the pregame, you know, Coach Markham and all his humility and the coach he was, you know, he let Eddie Robinson, you know, head coach of Jackson State and the godfather who was the head coach at Southern at the time. And then also um, W.C. Gordon, who was the head coach at Jackson State. They all spoke to us in the pregame and talked to us about the importance of, you know, being the SWAC representative and beating the MEAC school in, uh, in which was then the Heritage Bowl, which is the precursor of the Celebration Bowl. And so... Uh, that kind of like drilled in me, like for a head coach to give up that pregame talk to three guys who were legends who he respected so much, it let me know uh, what it meant to be swag. And so that's what that's what it's all about for me. And um, you know, with the fraternity aspect of it, you know, HBCU is more just about sports, it's the band, but also the fraternity is a big deal. You know, we have you know probates coming up on our campus. We have a couple of our guys who are going to be joining one of the best fraternities of Mega Sci-Fi and a couple <laughs> that are going to be also alphas and some, you know, we have the AKs coming out. So it, it's a big deal. Like on a college campus, when you have that probate, when everybody can come out and see those young men and young women become members of a Greek organization. And uh, that becomes our alumni because they have a reason to come back. And so uh, that's usually the people who want to give and want to donate, want to give back to football. And so it all, it all comes full circle. And um, I think the biggest thing out of, out of everything I talked to one of my young players. He's like, hey, man, you know, coach, I got a baby on the way. I just found out like a month ago, et cetera, et cetera. Baby's due in July. So and, and I, what I told him was like out of everything I've accomplished and, uh, and hopefully I have more that I'm still trying to do. Uh, but the biggest thing is I'm a dad, you know what I'm saying? And so to me, being a dad of three sons and being able to coach one of them and, and he was able to be he's an Omega now and you know, he was able to win two Mad City Classics and all that type of stuff. That's like my biggest accomplishment. If you tell me that, hey, man, you a great dad, that's my number one goal in life is to be a great dad. So I'm telling him, like, hey, man, your number one goal amongst everything else, you have got to be a great dad. And so I think to me, that's how you build the legacy of, of passing it down from one person to another, uh, one coach to the kids. And, and I think and just the, the final thing I would say is, you know, Coach Markham told us, um, hey, somebody in this room is going to be a future head coach at Alabama State one day. I didn't think he was talking to me, uh, but you had Reggie Barlow, who was the head coach at Alabama State, Travis Pearson, uh, who was the interim head coach of, of Alabama State, and then me. I'm a head coach. So he produced three head coaches of Alabama State. So if I'm fortunate enough to win the championship and produce one future head coach of Alabama State, then I can truly say I lived in the legacy of Coach Martin. 
Coach, well said. Well, uh, well, from one eighty-eight brother to another, well said. Like I said, I followed your career. Like I say, um, Kevin Smith, my boy, we used to go down to Cancun. We always say, hey, man, where's Eddie Rob at? Because we were down there with Steve McNair. They say, hey, man, you don't party like that, man. You don't come down there. Nah, man. Hey, they, they, <laughs> you didn't come down to Cancun to hang out with us, man. <laughs> nah, they, you know what? That's, that's funny you say that because they would always go to Cancun. And we was right there in Houston. It was a close, a quick flight. Yeah. But, but to me, it was always too close to training camp. And I, I was so focused on being in the best shape. i like, man, I am not messing this up, spending no weekend in Cancun. I, I can go to Cancun for the rest of my life. Right now, I'm getting ready for training camp in this San Antonio heat. So, <laughs> Man, I, I told Steve, listen, and I know you probably remember NFL Florida. You throw the parties down there. And I yeah. said, hey, man, it's a brother that, hey, man, he played the swag. Man, I said, where that brother at, man? He said, man, that brother don't party like that, dog. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> And you ought, you ought to come tell that to my kids. And they they swear like, man, coach, when you was young, I bested. Nah, man, I, I I had a lot coach of coach was not. Man. Hey, listen, he, Eddie George was down there, Steve was down there, but I will say, Coach Ron was always focused on the mission. I just yeah. I just Rock, I just had to put that out. That's inside base. Coach, what I'm talking about that little inside baseball right there for Absolutely. a little bit. Absolutely, yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> All right, coach. Well, well, Coach Rob, one thing I I've noticed about Coach Rob, he seems to be a very serious man, but at the same time. He's a very personal, personable man and very passionate. And, and Coach, I want to thank you for coming on the show and, and talking with us and uh, sharing, uh, uh, you know, uh, sharing things about your team. A lot of people on here asking about where can we see the game? You can't see the game. You can't see the game. The game is over with. The spring game is over with. There's nowhere to see it. They didn't want y'all to see it if you didn't come to the game. Like, like, you can buy them season tell them, coach, you can buy them season tickets, though. What they can't do is buy those season uh, tickets. Yeah, what happened, we was trying to record the game, and then some kind of way the video went bad. (laughs) 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 Wow. Yeah, Coach. Hey, I want to thank you, Coach. And uh, is there anything you want to say before you leave? Uh, I was going to ask you about your philosophy with recruiting, but we'll, we'll, we'll save that for next time. On a okay. you coach's corner, but anything you'd like to say before you get out of here, coach? Nah, man, I just think uh, the, the SWAC conference, uh, the MEAC also, HBCU football is just in a great place. And so, hey, just support your local HBCU, whichever one it is. I mean, these kids need a, need a whole lot, and uh, they're working their butts off. And we know that the NIL is going to the big schools, but hey, whatever you want to give to your to your HB, local HBCU, whether it's $20, 50 100000 whatever it can. But I just make sure we give back and support them because we're doing a great job of producing the leaders of tomorrow. So. All right. All right. All right. Good luck this week, Coach. Don't let me down. You tell your staff, don't let Cole down now. I got you, baby. We, you, know, you know we're working hard, so we're trying to get there. I got you. I got you. Thank you for All being right. on the show. All right, man, that was, that was an awesome interview. And, I, hey, we can thank Coach Cole for that, using his, his influence and his connections to make sure we bring the best HBCU content to our followers as possible. Coach, thank you again, Coach Cole, for hooking us up with Coach Robinson. Man, it was a, it was a great interview. He seems to be a, a tremendous guy. and You can see he's a leader of men, and uh, it's good to see that. Well, you know, we we always on this show want to talk from facts. You know, I know we all three get on and, and we talk about our, our opinions of things, but most of the time our opinions is already that we've talked with the with the people to be, you know, what they're thinking and where they are and where they're trying to go. So it's very important that we do that, where we put out truthful information and, and want our fan base to be intelligent and smart when they're watching, watching games. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can't believe how many people on here is like, where can we see the game? Where can we see the game? Uh, Again, it's coach's decision that y'all not seeing the game. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, But it was a good game. It was very, uh, it was very competitive. And, and now that Coach Cole here, we can kind of talk about what we saw in the game. Right, Mr. Campbell? We can, we can discuss uh, what we saw. Um, I'm, I just started off by saying what what I saw initially was like I said, they were making a point to be physical at the beginning of the game. I believe they ran the ball five to ten times in a row um, before they threw a pass. And uh, and as Coach Robinson said, he he one of the one of the, his his philosophies is that blocking and tackling is how you win football games. So 
and, and they definitely um, were blocking and tackling <laughs> in, in the in the first few plays because they stuck with the run uh, all the way till they got it in the end zone. And so, Coach Cole, um, what did you see? Well, you know, first of all, you know, there's was a new offensive coming in, and again, uh, checking Coach Barnett's background, he understands that you winning football, winning championships. And as we know and looked at stats last year, Alabama State played great defense and great special teams. They just struggled offensively. So he wanted to make sure that he established himself in the spring game. And in, in the first 10 plays, uh, eight of them was run. And, you know, we had we had a, a, a play in the, in the flats, and then, you know, we had the 65-yard touchdown. So I think he established – uh, what he wanted to see. Uh, and, you know, we came down to see one guy really is Andrew Body, and, and we seen, I mean, on the physical side, you know, he's a good 6'2", you know, about 210, uh, great size, great personality, come from a great family, uh, team leader. We seen that. We seen the players, you know, gather around him, you know, and he hadn't even been there a semester. And so everything that we, or I think Eddie Robinson wanted to establish going out, getting the probably what the best quarterback in the conference got it. Uh, the best def uh, offensive coordinator that fits his style of ball got it. Good staff, uh, got a great coach uh, from Bethune Cookman. Uh, there was a head coach before he needed that to help help with his leadership. He's done that so. Man, I, I just look forward to uh, uh, their season, you know. So so I've seen a lot of good things. He had a lot of people out, over 100 players. I mean, man, that's big, Coach. That guy, that's big. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with the Alabama State Hornets football program. Yeah, Coach, I I just think, um, and, and I'll let Mr. Campbell go here shortly, I just think, where they are in the program, they're executing at a high level. They're playing. It looks like they're having a, a lot of fun, but it doesn't seem like they have the pressure on them of being the, the, the pressure's not there. I want to know how they're going to behave once the pressure is put on them and expectations are put on them. And Mr. Campbell, with that being said, how, how do you, what did you see? Um, well, that's the reason why. I, that's the reason why I asked Coach that question, because and he he, he kind of answered that. It's basically we're going to try to take it one game at a time. We can't win a championship today, but it, it's because you know what? I'm going to tell you what's going to happen when the pressure's going to start. When Swag Media Day comes around in the next 30, 45 days, or whatever that is, and they're sitting at number one at these most likely, that's when people are going to start saying, "We expect you to win a championship. We expect to see you in Atlanta." And that's when things are going to say. But now what you got, and what I like about Coach Robinson, and just looking at his coaching staff, it looks like they're real in tune with their team. It looks like they're able to communicate very well with their team. He's got a bunch of younger guys and stuff like that. Yes, they say, as old folks say, they got, he got some hip young guys and stuff like that. So it looks like they're very close to the team. So, again, like you said, he had a player say, hey, Coach, I got this thing going on. So I, the communication was going to be key. To have a championship team, you got to have that communication with coaches and players to really create that family that you want to have a championship. So, you know, I'm, I'm super excited, you know, to see what they're going to do. Like I said, we, we saw some things. Again, it was vanilla. That's what a spring game is supposed to be. But what I wanted to hear more from what Coach asked the question, what were the coaches thinking? What was he looking to get out of the spring game? And he answered that. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 now, now what was and, – and, and we may not have understood – the rules of the spring game or how it was laid out because we were in the middle of setting up for a broadcast and then later we were broadcast. But that's one of the things that I kind of didn't understand is the layout of the spring game. And usually uh, you want to know that beforehand so you can understand what, what's going on. But to me, it just looked like a regular old football game, you know, for the most part. Is that what you saw, Coach, Coach Cole? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I mean, if you was an outsider and really didn't know what was going on, uh, you would think they got a problem on defense because, <laughs> you know, that offense went straight down the field, you know, three times in a row. 
and score. And, uh, uh, you know, that just don't happen, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, they didn't have all these starters in there and some folks was hurting and they, they was making some decisions. And like I said, always, you know, the spring is, is a time to find players, you know, it ain't, it ain't, it ain't a time to really wear down the guys that you know, that you already know that's good. It's a time that you find players. And so those players get opportunity to, to play. And of course, you all know that uh, body uh, just now getting down there. But shit, man, he he, he looked like he'd been there uh, all three years. Yeah, yeah. You know, Andrew looked like he was really acclimated and and, and locked into what was going on. Um, uh, I would, you know, at at one point, uh, you know, as we were talking when we were coming back from the game, you know, um, I think even though we're very excited about Andrew being part of the Alabama state football team and what the prospects are, I think they're trying to keep it very low key to keep the pressure off of Andrew. What do you, what do you think about that? Mr. Campbell? Well, I I think again, you you don't want to get too far ahead of yourself. This is his first practice run. You know what you got to work on. You've got a new offensive staff. So I think, again, they want to temper the excitement because, see, unlike Jackson State and FAMU, they came back with seasoned teams. You knew who the quarterback was. All the coaches were there. All the players were there. Jackson State made that back-to-back run. FAMU was ready to make their championship run. So it was a little bit different. Everybody knew what they were supposed to do. Everybody knew what the position pieces were on the board. Here at Alabama State, they're still putting pieces together. They got a new coaching staff, okay? So, hey, you can't just say, hey, we did this last year. It was successful. They don't know. Like Coach said, hey, we even got to talk about how we're going to communicate the offensive signals and things like that. Same thing with Andrew. He's learning his players. He's got to get the timing down and things like that. So it's a little bit different when you look at the previous SWAC champions over the last six or seven years. Because most of those, those teams have been together, and then they were ready to make their championship runs. This team has been put together basically on the fly. So that's one of the things that's going to be very interesting to see as they try to make this run. Um, Coach Cole, I'll ask you this. We saw what Andrew – had to offer what did you see in the backup quarterback uh for alabama state that's just where he is the backup we already, <laughs> we already established that andrew is going to be the guy and you know they last year quarterback entered to portal so i guess he see what we see you know there's no need to try to uh make it out <laughs> something that is not i mean you know he's a perfect fit uh you can't say enough about his uh is uh enough about how he go about his business you know he's a he's a very professional young man and i just look for big things from him yeah yeah i i mean i think looking at it you know from a distance not seeing it at practice you know we only saw the spring game it was clear that you know from a size standpoint you know and then the execution standpoint there was a drop off when they went to the backup quarterback. Uh, if that's any indication of what it'll be like next year, if they're going to have any chance of winning the SWAC championship, Andrew's going to have to stay healthy. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Um, you know, and, and the backup guy was a backup guy last year. So, you know, he really, you know, is learning a new offense as well. So maybe that was some of the things that he might have stumbled on. But – uh you know, I, I think body body is 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 a is a quarterback. He's an athlete. He's a running back. I mean, he the total package. And they got and they got some wide receivers that can get after. It. You know, uh, they threw two deep deep bombs on the money. So uh, uh, I just seen a lot of good things, man, that made me real excited about watching them this year. Yeah, I, I, I uh, you know we have a question about the O line. Um, what I saw with the starting O line, I saw some I saw some big guys, some good sized guys that did did really well. I must say, when the backup now, I don't know the you know, there wasn't the roster was not broke up in too deep, and and so we don't know who was actually playing. But one of the offensive units, I thought the line was a little undersized once they brought the backup quarterback in. And so, you know, that's that's always a concern if you have to go to your backups. You know where they are. You know how much drop off are you going to have in the offensive line? Because because one thing we do know about football, 
every team is going to have some injuries. And when you have to go to your backup guys, what do you what do you have there? And sometimes you don't find that out until you put them on the field. But but you know, guys, this is the spring. They, their recruits are not even in yet. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure they got some O-line that's coming in, some D-linemen coming in. And, and you know, they look sharp. They look sharp offensively. Defensively, you know, one thing on the defense side back, ball, you just want to make sure people know how to line up. And they hadn't even brought the recruits in. So, so I'm looking forward to them doing some great things, man. Uh, yeah, Coach, uh, is there any other observations, Mr. Campbell, that you had from the game? Well, again, I, I just think with the spring game, it is what it is. You know what I mean? You're not going to see a lot. You know, Coach wanted to get people out there healthy. Um, and Coach looks like one of um, people in the chat said the backup one, he wasn't. He just enrolled in January. So even to your point, he's really learning. <laughs> so, you know, so again, that's just your point. So I, I think, again, you know, you know, everybody, it's spring. You know, I mean, you can only read into it. But what I, I'm more wanting to see, and again, Coach asked that, is that they got a new coaching staff. You know, how did he feel about how that was going? Because the players are only going to go from the direction from the coaches, right? They set the tone. And if they're organized, then the players will be organized. If the coaches are not organized, then the players are not going to be organized. So, you know, for me, you know, I, I looked at more of – and that's the reason I kept asking about the coaches. Were the coaches ready to go? And things like – and like I said, just looking at the staff and looking at how well they were engaged, that's why I'm excited about to see what Alabama State does. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, man, look, we, we, we seen it. We was there. You know, we're pretty pleased. And – uh you know, like I said, I look forward to seeing the Hornets this year. I think uh, Coach Robinson has grown as a head football coach. Uh, you know, and one thing about it, you can change players, you can change coaches, as long as you don't change the head coach because he's got a systematic way that he, that he does things. You know, when a coach or head coach come in, it's a systematic way. So you're always getting changes, but as long as you stay with your system, and that's why I've seen the system, his system is working because of all those players that he continue to have and surely in the spring on the offseason. So you know the program is growing. Coach, you, you, bring, up, you bring up a very good po point, Coach, that he, this is it. This is – he's a he's – a, he didn't come from the assistant coach ranks. You know, he, he came from – uh, industry and went right in as a head coach. Uh, how hard is is that? I know you know. I know you were in the in the coaching ranks, but have you ever seen a guy do it coming straight off the street into coaching the way that Coach Robinson has done it? And have they been as successful as Coach Robinson has done up to this point? Well, I mean, you know. Caucasian coaches do it all the time. You know, they don't they, they don't play the game. They don't play the game. They read books and play Madden and, and uh, you know, and they do it all the time. And the thing about it is, is that when he took over Alabama State, Alabama State ain't never been just a slouch at the bottom program. You know what I mean? They 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 that was good for a coach like him to come in and learn you know, on the fly. But my man just read all the stats off. Two-time defensive player of the year. Two-time academia All-American. And All-American. And then played in the NFL. So he ain't no slouch to football. You know what I mean? It's just that we, as African-Americans, we don't get them opportunity. We got to come ready-made. And especially on these other levels, we got to come ready-made. And we hard on ourselves, you know. But the opposite, the white guys, they get to come in and learn on the job. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So so Eddie got a chance to grow with his it with the program. It happened to be his alma mater, so I'm not surprised. Eddie Robinson is a is a super guy and he's a very intelligent man. All right, Mr. Campbell, have you seen anything like evident in your time? Uh, in this way. Well, you know, I was thinking, and then, you know, 
I was thinking about what Coach Robinson was talking about, Coach Markham, who, who was on W.C. Gordon's staff, which was amazing staff, the coaches that came out of that staff. You know, and Coach Cole, uh, most of our coaches, again, came through the ranks, worked their way up, had to pay their dues, didn't have the nepotism where, hey, he's my friend, he's my cousin, he's my brother. So we've had consistently where guys had to work their way up. I think Coach Robinson, is, I'm, he got that position because of the quality of man he is. That has a lot to do with it. You can talk to him and you can look at Coach Robinson and say, hey, this guy is a leader, no matter what he does or anything in life. So, again, the football, you can't, the guy is a football player. He knows football. He's always known football. Like I said, and don't forget, like I said, that's the reason why I wanted to point out, Eddie Robinson is one of the smartest players in SWAC history. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm, saying I'm talking about as far as winning academic awards. So this was nothing for him to say, you know what, let me come in, let me stabilize the program. Also, I'm going to be a good face for the pro program. You know what I mean? And that's what he, he's a really good face for the program. I mean, he can help raise money. He can bring enthusiasm because the rest of it, again, like Coach, no, because Coach Robinson, he's a CEO coach. He's not, he's not, he's a defensive coordinator, offensive coordinator. He's CEO coach. So that means he's got to make good choices on who his offensive coordinator is, who his defense coordinator is, and make sure that the players are all marching in the same direction. Hey. And coach, I want to ask you this here, Coach Cole. Do you think Eddie Robinson gets that that chance at Alabama State because of the success that Dion had at Jackson State? Uh, in his case, no. His case was more of a what you know and who you know. You know, he went to school with the president. You know, let's not make any secret. Like I said, we like to talk about facts. You know, Eddie Robinson was also an analyst. He would, he would come in and interview you. He'd interview me. He's hosted some of my games. So I'm pretty sure the talk the talk was there. You know what I'm saying? Uh, did Dion play, being there, played a little role in? Yes. Because at the time, once Dion came in, then all of a sudden, everybody started running out looking for NFL football. <coughs> so, yeah, it played a role in it. But I didn't think it played. It was some that was brewing and some that was growing uh, uh, from when they chose this president. Who's the president now? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that's some that's some inside. So, so that's some inside stuff. Not saying he wasn't wasn't qualified to take the job, but he sure didn't have all the qualifications that a whole bunch of other people have. He kind of sort of jumped the line as well. And let me ask you this, Coach. When you when you jump the line as a coach, does that put pressure on you as a coach? Shoot, you, the AD, the president, everybody. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you, you really you going ahead of everything. You know what I mean? You're going against the grain. So uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Most definitely uh making that move put a lot of pressure on a lot of people. But he's been he's been able to um, he's been able to do what he, do the right thing and moving the program. Now you know this year, you know I've been talking about them maybe winning the East. You know if he come and stink it up, I mean hey, you know that would definitely be brought up that he was given a job without earning it. Mm. So, hey, what is the thing? What have you done for me lately? Yeah. Well, I, I was just – that's one of one of the questions I had. You know, one of the things I was wondering is, one, had he – you know, the, his his situation was similar to Dion's in the sense that they were NFL players, didn't do – didn't coach in the SWAC as assistants, and then they were, give, they were uh, hired as head coaches um, at – you know, HBCUs. Um, I don't, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, that, you know, there, Dion had tremendous success right out the bat. The other two coaches that were given opportunities similar to Dion is Eddie Robinson and then Eddie George. Eddie George hadn't had a tremendous amount of success as a coach, right? I believe he's helped the university out some. Um, um, regarding their raising their profile and even help maybe even help them with raising money, right? But right. Eddie Robson, for the most part, I think he's going to be judged 
you know, by his success on the field. And up to this point, he has a he's had a gradual ascension. I want to say he's he made he went six and five his first year, and he went seven and four last year. So um as Mr. Campbell has mentioned, this could be the year uh, for Alabama State to to get over the hump and, and possibly win the East and, and, and buy for a SWAC championship. My only question, you know, one of the things that I look at is you made a great point, Mr. Campbell, is that the other teams that have, who have won the SWAC in the last three years, they were settled at quarterback. They were settled. They had some things settled that now Alabama State didn't come out of their season with them with them settled already. They they had a question at quarterback. They were losing a all conference. Uh, some felt like de- defensive MVP. Like they have some questions uh, coming out of that, and uh, but but that target is going to be put on their back anyway. So, you know, I guess what what I'm saying is I understand how they can have those expectations, but I think Coach Robinson, you know. Would it be fair to say that he should have a better season than the previous year, having those questions coming out of last year? Well, that's the thing. I, I think he's building the program. See, this goes back to what, what I talked about. He's in year three. What, this is where you start seeing the fruits of your labor. Everybody knows how he runs things. He's got his people in place. He's, he has players that have been with him now for three years. It's not like the whole team is transfers, okay? So he's got a good group that has been around their juniors now, they should be leaders that are going to be able to set the table for that team. And again, it goes back to my point again. If you want to be a champion, it starts before the football season starts. It starts way back in the spring. It starts when these guys are in the weight room where they're only the strength of conditioning coach and the strength of conditioning coach is not even there. So these are the things to be a championship squad. So those are the things that, again, what Alabama State is going to have to put together. You got Andrews coming. Andrew is a natural born leader. That is very obvious. But again, he's new at Alabama State. So he's again, he's got to know his learn his his, his players, his you know, his teammates and things like that. So again, when you look at everybody else, Jackson State is going to be tough. Sam is going to be tough. There's no doubt about it. So, you know, again, it's not going to be where you see, like the last couple of years, it was Jackson State, then Fam U. Then it was last year, it was Fam U. Now you're talking about three teams that, depending on who you like and what you like, all of them can say, we got the best team in the East. That's a fact. So there's no head and shoulders team that is in the East to say, you look at that guy and that team, FAMU is that much better than Jack State or Jack State is that much better than Alabama State. So that's what's going to be interesting now as we go into the spring and to what coaches say, you got to understand something. You're going to see a flood of players that all of a sudden that are going to come to Alabama State, Jackson State, FAMU. Because that portal is wide open. And these kids are not getting the offer that they think they get. And I'm talking about high-level kids that jumped in that portal. So there's going to be some opportunity to even upgrade in the portal for all these teams. So you're going to be seeing guys like, oh, wait a minute. Like I said, fam, you just signed a guy from Pitt today. You know what I mean? Out of nowhere. So, again, these coaches are working that portal. So to Coach's point, it's a lot of things that have not even been settled yet as far as the, the roster. Yeah. Uh, with that, and here's the thing, too, guys. Eddie's been in his program for two years, going on three. Cozy is starting off his program. Uh, T.C. Taylor over there is just one year in. So, you know, you, you, got, you got one program is, is two years ahead of, of, of the next program. So all, that, all, that, all that's going to play in the, uh, a part of where we go and how we go and, 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 and who's going to win and who's not going to win. You know, Coach Cole, we've talked about the turnover in amongst the coaching ranks extensively on this channel. Um, with that being said, Coach, off the top of your head, where does Coach Rob rank amongst the coaches that are in the SWAC right now? And as as, as talent wise, no, no, I'm talking about no, no. Take the players aside. Players right. aside, where does he rank as a coach? of the coaches that are in the SWAC right now? Uh, I, I think he's one, 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 one up there with some of the best of them. Because when you when you really look at him, you got a new coach at Alcorn. He's been, 
He was at Pine Bluff for one or two years, didn't didn't do well. But now he's the head coach at Alcorn. Uh, you got T.C. Taylor, got his first job, all right? You got uh, Coach uh, at Texas Southern, his first job. And you look at his background, he, it, it doesn't look strong. Uh, you got the Pine Bluff guy who was a tight end coach from Monroe, which was the worst Division I A school in the comp, comp, country, country last year. He's got his first thing. He, he didn't do much this year, all right? Bethune Cookman, new coach. So you have, you have to put Eddie up in the top. You got Mickey Joseph, you know, with, that comes with some experience. You know, uh, he was an interim at Nebraska, head coach at Langston. You know, he's been in the SWAC. So you look at some good things from him. Uh, uh, but, you know, you got to say Eddie is one of the top better coaches there just just by default. <laughs> and that and – that- and that's what I was. That what I, that's what I was kind of getting at. Oh, you were setting me up. Oh, you were <laughs> you were all on that. Hey, Cole. Well, they already do that, Coach. <laughs> no, 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 no. What I'm saying, Coach, Coach Cole. I I want to say, and you, our logic kind of lined up. What I'm saying is, by default, by default, he he is the most accomplished returning. I would say him and TC Taylor. Are the two most accomplished returning coaches in the swag. Wait a minute, I gotta put a dead stop on that. Please do not forget Bubba McDowell, who actually has won oh, conference okay. championships. You're, you're right. I mean you're division right. championships. So right. let's let's you let, let's pump can the brakes on that. On the east, can we put that on the east? Yeah, day? yeah. Okay, yeah. Let's yeah, because I like I said, we kind of leave him, and we got to give Coach McDowell credit. So and, on that, but go ahead. And, and speaking of that, guys, I put a, a media pass request in to PV. Uh, today and hopefully uh, they'll reply and I'll go down there and, and cover that game and, and be able to give you guys some um, input on what's going on down there at uh, uh, pray, on the hill, as they say in prayer. Yeah, let me, yeah, let me apologize to Bubba. I mean, but Bubba's another one, though, uh, Campbell. I mean, he's been around. And he coached in the defensive backs, but what, he's been three three years in prayer view and what, two West championships? Yeah. Now let's look yeah. at that on his face, though. No, what no, he's only say? coached two one, years. One, two years, yeah, two, two years. Two and years. he's won one, right? So he go to he go to the championship once, right? Yep. And yeah. I think that was in his first year. No, he went the second year. Second, second year, year, last year, this past yeah. year. Yeah, look what happened that second year. Remember we talked about that? How Texas Southern first it was Southern should have won. They lost it. Gave it to Texas Southern. Texas Southern lost it. It fell in Prairie View's lap. Well, no, that wasn't that wasn't the year. Yeah, that, that was two years that, ago. That Prairie that View. Was, yeah, that was that was two years ago when everybody. That was two years. Southern ended up going to the championship. Yeah, that was two and, years ago. But to your and, point, they could have beat if they had to beat uh, Mississippi Valley. They would have played in the swag correct. championship rather than Southern. So right. you, correct. You you got a point. They got beat by Mississippi Valley the right. last game of the season to get eliminated right. from contention. Right. So one would say. I'm in contention to win the SWAC championship. I go play the worst team, perennial worst team in the history of the conference, and I lose. That's not that's not a that's that's not a good sign for a head coach because now you're saying that you didn't prepare your team. But you can't you you know you can't take nothing away from winning, and 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 bubble should be mentioned. But I, I wouldn't say that he's in the top. Well, let, let me let me give you know I think we we're doing a disservice because we're we're making a, a judgment on something that we need to you we do realize. Let's talk about this for a second. Other than Carnell Maynard and Coach McDowell, every other team in the SWAC has transitioned their coach in the last two years. Every team. Think about that for a second. Every team on the east and west side have transitioned their coach. Really, really, so, every team except for A and M. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so for us to start saying who's this and who's that, none of these guys have had even a long track record to even basically even to have a realistic conversation because there's not a resume long enough to even sit back and say this guy's this. So by default, Coach Robinson, who's been there three years and he has his team trending upwards. 
then yes, you can see because you can see his team trending upward. That is the thing what you see. So again, that's the only reason why I kind of, you know, it's not like when you, you're seeing with the SEC and they've got guys that have been there or, you know, in the, the Big Ten or and guys have kind of been there. You can kind of look at their resume. The swag is just had, and which is sad, the, the amount of turnover in the coaches is ridiculous over the last two years. Well, 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 well Mr. Campbell, the question was asked, where did I see Eddie was at? If you uh, come to come uh, September and you're not ready to play, you know, you can't, you know, I, I ain't one of the ones that say, oh, well, this is just my first year or this is my second year. The object of being in that position is to win football games and to win championships, you know. But I get it what you're saying. I mean, it makes sense. But when the question was asked, you know, you have to take what you have. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. No, you I understand. Just, but I, I just limited, want to just kind of give, you know, give the audience limited, some limited, depth to that. Yeah. Yeah, take lemon and make lemonade. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's kind of where I was. And, you know, of course, Coach Banner would be the grandfather of the league. <laughs> <laughs> Which is amazing when you say that. It's just utterly yeah. amazing. And, and, and I and, always go say this. In the last 23 years, all the coaches who won the conference is, is on the shelf, you know, and very few of them are even coaching in the SWAT. And you're right, it should never be a turnover like that. It hurts the league, it hurts young coaches, it hurts players that want to come out and go places. When you get that much turnover in coaches. <clears throat> is uh, uh, Rocky out? Coach Campbell. Yeah, I'm sorry. I had a phone call that came in, Coach. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can, I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah. I can hear you. Rocky. Yeah, hey. but you know. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here, Coach. But, Coach, but coach you know what was funny? It, but that, that kind of jumps back to, again, the golden era. When you're talking about, again, the continuity of coaches, Eddie Robinson, Marino Castle, W.C. Gordon, Archie Cooley. You know what I mean? The consistency that was all across the conference that you saw that were these giant figures that you could look at and say, hey, you know what, when you looked at that matchup, you knew that coach was going to be across the sideline from the team that you rooted for. So, again, I'm hoping that as we – these coaches – like I said, again, you, I, I just would like to see these ADs, a lot of these coaches, a little bit of growth, a lot of them to build their programs, and then, you know, see what's going on. Because I just think this – you know, switch your coaches out every two years. I just don't think you're ever going to build a championship program doing that. Let, let me ask you this, guys, because I can't remember off the top of my head, but has the 80 turnover mirrored the coaching turnover? The 1980s? No, 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 no. I said the the 80 turnover, because I know we've had some. Oh, the athletic oh. director turnover. Yes. The athletic director turnover has it mirrored the coaching turnover, meaning it not like, not as bad as the coaches because Southern AD's been there. You you got it. You got it. New AD at Valley. He's been there one year. New at FAMU. New at FAMU. Uh, shoot, coach. New at Prairie View. And shoot, coach. I think that's it. Yeah. What about what about Pine Bluff, Grambling? Um, same, same. But Trey Scott's been there. He's been there a couple of years. Grambling's been there. Yeah. Alcorn's been there. No, Alcorn got a new one. They got yeah. a new one. But that's about it. Yeah. So so it hasn't. So the coaching turnover hasn't mirrored the. Uh, no, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think that yet. I think that. Yeah, I don't think there's no any correlation to that. I think the correlation is is the arms race of this quick fix of seeing somebody like Dion just come in, which you, you can't even measure what that was like, and expecting a team, especially when you don't even have the infrastructure ready to go, you know, and turn a, a guy over. So, again, I think, again, you just got to let these coaches get their time, put in a program. Nobody's going to come in. And that's what I'm saying. It's just not realistic for a coach to come in and win 10 games right off the rip. I, I mean, that's just – Nah, that's why actually it was going to be funny. I mean, that's the pressure that Coach Coase is going to be under. That that's the pressure he's under. 
because they expected him to keep that train on track. But again, you got to allow these coaches to grow. And that's my biggest thing is allow these coaches to grow. Allow these coaches to make, make mistakes. Allow these coaches to recruit players. And then see what, but you can't, like I said, you fire a guy after two, three years. I mean, you're just not to me. I don't think you're going to get, get, get value out of that. It, you know, you know, as we, as we talk about this and the coaching turnover, turnover at nauseum, ultimately, I think, you know, um, in FAMU's case, they got it right. You know, I think they did. They got it right. Um, when you talk about, Let's talk about two other schools that uh, that had coaching turnovers in the same hiring cycle, which is Southern and Grambling, right? And you know the season, it, you know the season will play itself out, and we'll we'll understand. But it seems to me that they went, especially Southern, rather than getting the best qualified coach. They went with the default choice. And in that situation, I see them in a couple of years hiring another coach. You know? And so yeah. and when when ADs are putting in putting making those decisions, how can you not end up changing coaches out year after year after year? Well, Southern AD said it. I mean, which he said we, we don't have the money. <laughs> he said it. He said we don't have the money. And again, when when you say that, you know, I I that was some, see again. This is what this is just my soapbox. When you have a school like Southern that has the fan base like they do, that has the recruiting area like they do, be very clear. The fertile recruiting area that Southern sits at, and then you don't and you say, well, we just don't have the money. We're just going to take the guy that we can afford. I think you're not doing a service to your university and to the football program. And I think it's going to show in wins and losses. So, I, like I said, again, I don't think Southern's going to win over four games. And I think that's what's going to happen because they did not say, you know what, we're going to dig deep. We're going to find out because, again, Southern should always be good just because they're sitting down there with all that talent lose them. They should always be good, not being funny. So, you know, they just haven't. So I, I've yeah. heard you use the term in, in other coaching uh, appointments – or hires as a lazy hire, um, would, would, you know, with all due respect to Coach Graves, would you categorize that hire from an 80 standpoint as a lazy hire? I would. I would. And um, um, because if I'm going to get rid of the head coach of a losing program, why would I turn in hard assistant coach? It, it just it just looked dirt. It got dirt all over. It. You know, was the assistant coach saying something to the AD about the head coach? You know, what is it? We wasn't winning. What is it? And then the guy wasn't even a coordinator. He was just assistant coach. And I hate to say that. I mean, how many times did that happen? That that's a that's a lifetime hire right there. You know. Uh, and then my thing is, I'm looking at the AD. You brought this guy in. And you're not gonna fight for this guy to stay around, then I need to get rid of you and the head coach. Cause you you made a big major mistake. You know, so so to me it was a, it was it was just it's just all of it it looks, you know, to me the only thing that can can turn that black eye, put a big rib eye stake over it, is that they win this year. If they don't win, that AD need to be going. And of course, the coach need and and clean house at Southern. Southern is a a winning program. Pete Richardson left that program in great shape. You know, we need we need to go out and hire some qualified guys that got some qualified experience at least at the head coaching position. Where am I at? Southern is not a losing program, so I don't need nobody a coach that that have taken zero and ten teams and turned them around. I need a guy to take them where they are and move forward. So I, I need a guy that 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 that's a winner, you know. So you can break each place down and say whether it was a good heart or not a good heart. Yeah, coach. So, I I just you know, you know when we first and 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 I must say I was on board with with Scotty when he identified Coach Robinson as a 
as a brotherly hire. You know what I mean? It was. It but was. After, but but again, coach, after evaluating Coach Robinson, you know, sitting down, listening to him, look, look, listening what his pedigree is, not only as a student, a player, and now coach, I think Coach Robinson is kind of justified to hire up to this point. But right. Coach, you you said now as a coach, he wasn't a coach. He's never coached anything. But he's a diamond in the rough. He's one that it just don't happen every day. But did he have the pedigree? As far as everything else as a CEO, and I take that from you. Yes. Yes. And he's intelligent and he was smart enough to do what he need to do. Look. They hit it. They hit. They hit the grand slam, coach. They hit it. Now he ain't won the championship yet, but they 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 hit a home run. Hey, you know I want to. We we can go. We're gonna go ahead and take a couple callers tonight before we quit. We're gonna yeah. give you guys a few minutes to to call in if you want to call in. We got some a lot of <laughs> chatter going on in the chat, and uh and 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 uh, Coach Green says it, it was not a lazy hire. Uh, but I want to say you can give us a call at 518-351-9464. Please what, what, call what, in and explain to us why it wasn't a lazy hop. Coach, well, Coach Green was Coach Green was saying, and Dooley, we trust. So you know how much do we want you even want to hear what Coach Green is about to say about that. But all Coach I heard was Green, Dooley. Coach Green. He, he, he's a Southern alumnus who coaches at Rust. And all I'm going to say is, is that Southern did not beat Jackson State. They did not beat FAMU. And they did not win any significant game in those two years that Dula was there. They, they did. Lost, and they lost to Texas Southern. So, so I stop it. So let tell me it say to people. And let, let me make sure, because we, we, you know, again, you know, we like to build people up. Terrence Grace does have background, does, is qualified. This ain't about Terrence Graves. This is about the process. It was a, it, it, we, we, I guess we all three agree. It wasn't a good process how he was given the job. Well, I, I'm going to tell you this. I, I just think when you look at the coaches, Eddie Robinson, a T.C. Taylor, a James Cozy, and I'm just going to use those three guys, energetic guys, forward-facing looking guys, able to relate to players. And just Coach Graves, and again, I have not played for Coach Graves, but I'm just talking about when you just look at it. it when I saw that Coach Iron, I was not excited. And that's what I'm talking about. When and, you and, go, and, and I just want to make sure we understand this is not against Coach Graves. No, not at, not at all. Not this at all. Not an attack on him. Hell, no. Anybody would take a job. Yeah, not at all. But what I'm saying is when you, when, when I heard a name like Trey Oliver, you know what I mean? That potentially, because we, we're moving into a new era. And I think people have to understand that with social media, with NIL, with communicating, because this is not the my way or the highway coaching system anymore. You've got to deal with a lot more outside noise than coach you had to deal with. And God knows with W.C. Gordon and those guys. So and my thing is, you. <clears throat> so, so you really got to have people that can, just like what Coach Robinson did. He came on here. He was phenomenal. I was Coach T.C. Taylor. He's been interviewed. He's phenomenal. These guys can communicate, and you can say, you know what, I want my son to go play for that guy. And that's all I'm saying with Southern, with all the things that Southern comes with, you, it looks like you can get the guy that has, what, what again, what a coach now in this era should be. And that's, like I say, that's just more of an opinion. It's had nothing against, like I said, Coach Gray has a tremendous coaching experience. So, again, I'm not talking about that, but I'm just talking about the excitement that I think that Southern would need for them to be a championship caliber team. All right, we, we, we have Coach uh coach green on the line coach green thank you for calling in on the hbcu coaches corner i think this your first time coach. this your first I, time ain't it hey yeah this is my first time calling on your show man it is all right coach, how y'all guys doing we doing we doing good coach now now again i i, I brought it up because i've heard the term lazy hire used in other coaching hires even in other sports by coach camp you know by mr camp right and I and I brought it up to ask the question: Was this a lazy hire by Southern the Southern AD uh, Roman Banks? And and Coach <laughs> and Coach Cole stepped up and said, "Without a doubt, it's a lazy hire." Now tell tell me why do you think it was not a lazy hire? 
I wouldn't call it a lazy hire for one, because a lazy hire will be what Texas, basically what Texas Southern did. Wow! After all that situation, this wasn't a lazy hire because Coach Gray's background. I wouldn't call it a Gray's hire because of his background, because of his coaching pedigree. You know, and the years he put in. That's that's my thing to it. I would say, you know, what, what, it what? wasn't an exciting hire, and it wasn't a hire that gets you excited. But it's a lot to be said. You know, it's a wait and see approach with him. You know, as far as with the fan base. With the fa- let me ask you this, Coach Green, because I'm I'm about to give Southern some flowers with the fan base and support that that university has, right? Do they deserve, when they change coaches, to just choose the guy who was already an assistant coach on an already losing program? Look, the only thing I'm going to say is, let's just see what, what, what happens, because... This is a guy that been in the coaching ranks for years and waiting for his opportunity. His only opportunity became all came through being on the interim. Let, let, and let, when he became coach, every time he been an in interim, he has won. One game, Coach Green. This Coach Cole. Coach, man. How you doing? I, no, no, no. I, look, look, we get his one game. We get his one game. But he always been a winner with that. With that one game, so now let's see what he do with the whole season. Go, go and you got to understand with the duty situation. With the duty situation, they it's the people with the money that wanted him gone. So they got they put up the money to get him up out of there. Coach, so Coach, Green. Gonna do? Coach Green, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. You, a guy coached two games and he and he win the game, and and, and and you saying that's what that's what kind of took him over. Ain't no question. This ain't about. No, I'm just saying. You know, so, I, I, so I ain't saying. Make, make sure we understand because I think you get more into the, you know, I know, uh, and he been waiting on this position. We're talking about one of the as, as Coach Campbell would say, one of the bluegrass programs of the swag or, or Rocky says that all the time. The blue blood. <laughs> one of the blue, blue blood. blood. This is Southern University. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Did that hire make us right. feel like, man, we ready to rock and roll? No, it didn't. Not only was he, he was not in a coordinator's right. position, he was just a position coach. I get it. I get it. It, it came down to a money thing. But once again, like I told Cameron Rocky, when Simmons left Florida A&M for greener pastures and 500000 I said, well, did any of y'all alumni or AD say, I tell you what, Simmons, we want you here so bad, we're going to give you a 10-year deal, you know, at 400000 and we're going to add on. So, So what I'm saying is, they could have went out and got a bigger tab coach, worked out a deal for him. So not only does the 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 did we get a good guy in there, it excites the alumni. That hire did not excite the alumni. That's but what I'm saying. I guess that you, hire is you every, cannot raise you money it. and say we got a new coach in. We need this kind of money. They ain't gonna give it to Terrence. He's going to have to prove it. Now, I'm like yeah, you, like, cool, like but... we said about Eddie tonight. Hey, Alabama State took a chance. Bam, he stood in there. He knocked one over the wall. They knocked one over the wall with a good guy. Terrence got that opportunity. That's what I want to say. Yeah. Hey. That's, and, that, and that's how I'm looking at it. Look. Okay. okay. Hey, as you saying, with Coach, Coach Graves didn't deserve it. No, 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 no. That's not what no, he said. No, that's not what he said. 
That, that's no, not what he not, said. No, he didn't no, say that I about know, Kobe. No, I, I know. No, I know what he. I know what he meant. I know what he meant, but that ain't how I mean it. But I'm just saying, this, this is, he's basically the same shoes as Eddie Robinson. That's what all I'm saying. He's basically in the same shoes as Eddie Robinson. Because Eddie Robinson really was no exciting hire. Just like Graves ain't no exciting hire. Look, hey, with Eddie Robinson. So now you see what they do. Because what? I, I wasn't for Eddie Robinson getting hard. I mean, I would say I wasn't for him or was against him, but I thought it was a whole bunch of other more qualified people out there. But I knew the inside of that Alabama State deal. You know, he was alumni and all that. Mm-hmm. He was a two-time All-American, an academic. Yeah, that was the deal. And, and it, and it Southern could... didn't have a deal with Terrence Graves. So, he ain't no alumnus of that school. Even though he was on Pete Richardson's staff, nah, I know that whole deal. And 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 let's and let's say this, and I'm I'm gonna say this right, and this may sound kind of high minded, but with the success and pedigree of Coach Eddie Robinson, he didn't. I believe there are some aspects of him he didn't have to come to the SWAC as an assistant coach. Or coordinator, his pedigree said that I operate at such an elite level, at a, a such a high level of success in my personal and business life. If I'm going to come be a swag coach, I got to be the head man. And I think that's, I think after talking to him, understanding his pedigree, understand his accomplishments, I understand. I, I, I can see how that that could be the situation with Coach Robinson that he wasn't going to come to the swag. Or he wasn't going to be a coach unless he was going to be the head man based on his success and his pedigree. But, and, and then also, this is the other thing y'all should look at it like this. On the one side, the ball was actually more consistent. You know, the issue was on the offensive side with Southern. It wasn't the defensive side. Everything was on, and it wasn't a special team. Everything was offense. So now let's see what they do. So they change one side of the ball because on the offensive side, only one person controlled everything offensively, and that was Dooley. He controlled what he played. He controlled if they're going to pass or if they're going to run and what quarterback going to play. He only wanted one particular quarterback. He didn't want to give nobody else a try, no matter how bad it was looking. Well, let me let me, let me, let me ask a quick question, and, and this is more. Defense. Let's see what we're, let's see what's going to happen. Well, well, Coach, all right, Coach Green, let me ask you this question. And this is because, again, you're, you're a Southern guy. You know Southern. I try to follow Southern. I'm not a Southern guy. But I'm going to give you the outside looking in, okay? When I'm watching, and I'm talking about energy, and I'm looking, Jackson State just signed a guy from Cincinnati. Fam, you signing a guy from Pitt. Uh, Coach Robinson is getting an all swag linebacker to come from UAPB to come to Alabama State. He gets Andrew Body to come to Alabama State. Fam, you gets an all swag um, linebacker from Valley to come. I don't see the, the, the portal being worked for Southern. And what my thing is, is where is the energy on the recruiting side? That's what I guess my point of it is, is having dynamic coaches who can go in the portal, sell their, their squad, sell their school, and have players to come in. Because I'm going to keep saying this again. You guys are right there. Literally what FAMU was doing, you got any guy that at LSU is not playing should be over there at Southern. Seriously. And I don't see that energy. And again, we're all mm-hmm. following the same um, recruiting channels. We're all looking, and I never see Southern sign X, Southern sign X, Southern sign X. But I see Jackson State, I see FAMU, I see Alabama State, I see Bethune Cookman. So that's what I guess my question is: Where is that recruiting energy that you all need? Because no matter what you're saying, offensive defense, you guys did not beat a winning team. You guys didn't beat anybody. So what are you going to do to take that next step? That requires to have better players. So that's my question. So, and this is the thing, as a coach, we, we all, you know, as Coach Cole knows, nobody knows what's going to happen to the, the game star plan. Only people that know what's going on is the people that's inside that building with the football team. The coaches know what they got on the field. And as far as recruiting, after the spring game, it, that portal gonna be jumping because right now it's jumping on the basketball side. That portal gonna be jumping. I know we in the portal. We we trying to hit some people in the portal as far as basketball. 
But as far as that portal, there's going to be some people that are going to be signed after the spring break, after the spring game. Because spring game coming up, and then and then they're going to start jumping after that. Hey, Coach Green, I want to ask you a quick question before we let you go, because this is this question I've been dying to ask a Southern Knight. Dying to ask them. If we roll back time, and you guys have fired Dooley, right? And you guys are going through the hiring process and you have Fred McNair available or Terrence Gray's available, who would you have chosen as your head coach? She would be out of time for Fred McNair. Okay, that's what I thought. Well, yeah. good thing about it, Coach, you guys do have Fred McNair. He's not the head coach, but he is on your coaching staff. staff. I got you. Hey, that's a hell of a staff too, Coach. I I, I just want to say I, I just want to say one thing, and I I hear that, but I I just think what a lot of these teams have done, like case in point, you guys, you said, well, I'm going to get players late in the portal, but you've already lost a whole spring, and that's why a lot of these teams were trying to get guys in so they can play spring ball. So again, I want to see what Southern does. You know what I mean? I, I can say, I've always said this. We need we need Southern to be good. We need Grambling to be good. We need Jack State to be good. We need Alabama State to be good. We need FAMU to be good. Because again, you want to have these compelling matchups every week. That's what the SWAC is about. That's what I grew up with. And that's what I want to see. And I want to see a good Southern football team. But as far as like, you know, doing signing day, we signed a nice class. A solid class. The class is solid that we signed. Okay. Okay. So, I, I guess. But but and, it, it, know, most of them guys ain't gonna be there until after the spring game. But it but in this era of the transfer portal portal, how many how how much can you count on incoming freshmen or high school guys to determine the outcome of your your season? Like I said, we we right here, all of us on the outside, we ain't gonna know. The only people gonna know is the people and Coach Cole know this. Coach Cole knows since he coached the game. Everybody gonna have an opinion, but nobody knows what's actually gonna happen until the coaches say what's gonna happen. And until the games actually start being played. Because the coaches and players gonna know what's gonna happen. Until then, we're gonna have to wait and see what's gonna actually happen. Well, ain't, ain't, ain't no question. At the, at the end of the day, somebody's gonna have to win, you know. And uh, like like we mm -hmm. talked about the all the coaches, you know, we got a, lot, a bunch of coaches in our conference that don't have a lot of experience as head coach. Uh, you know, Bubba was a DB coach. Eddie was out of coaching. Uh, Terrence got some coordinator experience. Uh, the guy up at uh, Pine Bluff had no head coaching experience. I only think he had a uh, coordinator experience. Maynard was the only one that actually was coming from a head coaching job. Mickey Joseph was the interim, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and he don't have uh, no coordinator, but he was a head coach in Langston, you know, so he had some experience. Uh, Cozy, Cozy, was he an office coordinator? He was, no, he he was defensive back coach. He was, head, he was a head coach in Canada. Yeah, though. yeah head coach in Canada, yep. And he was okay. defensive back coach for him. Yeah. Okay, well, there you go. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the guy down at Mississippi Valley State, he was a wide receiver coach at Delta, Delta State. So he comes in with no no experience. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy at Alcorn, which I think is real good, uh, he uh, he had here coaching experience as well as some some coordinating experience. So, you know, none of them didn't come with a wealth, but but enough. So uh, uh, we'll see, we'll see. All right, thank you, Coach Green, for calling, yeah. man. We appreciate you calling yeah, in, man. I, I just wanted to get your input on why no, you no didn't problem, think man. that was a lazy hire, and you explain yourself well. Thank you very much for calling in. <laughs> Will Davis, no, he, no, he, 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 had, he had tremendous energy. He was hollering out, "Dooley, we trust," all, all the way through as that ship was sinking. So yeah, he oh, did have energy. He had a lot of energy. <laughs> hey, hey, when he was our coach, it was "Dooley, we trust." Dude. <laughs> hey, now I, all about, hey, it's all about digging graves for everybody else. <laughs> graves is good. Graves is good. <laughs> hey, hey, coach, coach, don't, 
don't you get Coach Graves chasing me around now. I, I, you know, it, it never was about it was about the process. And hey, we all the time oh, yeah. to our opinion. But right. like you say, when the ball is kicked off, hey, he on the clock. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He hey, when is, when is the, the spring? Like when is the spring coach. game, Coach Cole? I mean, uh, Coach Coach Green. When is the Southern Spring uh, Spring game? Supposed to be April thirteenth. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I look forward to you mm -hmm. giving. Maybe are you gonna go to the spring game? Nah, man. I, I'm I'm in Holly Spring, Mississippi, trying to recruit for basketball. Oh, man. okay. And I also coaching tennis too. Oh, okay. All right. So we 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 in our recruiting thing, so I ain't gonna have time to go down to Baton Rouge. One okay. time for Russ College. Absolutely. Hey, well thanks oh, again. Yeah. Oh yeah. Thanks again, Appreciate Coach Green. It. Hey, that was Coach Green giving us a call, man. But hey, we've reached that time of the show, guys, man. This is a this was a great, great, great show. Uh this was a great yeah, show, we, man. We, we, I and we 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 we've had a great week, guys. So with that being said, Coach Cole, can you take us out? Man, I can take you out. I, I just want to give a shout out to my middle school. I mean, my elementary school team coach. You know, these kids hadn't played no ball. They don't play recreation at all. And we had one practice, one practice, man. And and I put the zone together and a one four offense. And man, those kids played great, man. I just. You know, I, I don't know, man. I, I think when I think of my coach career, you know, my best times, man, has been working with kids, man. And, uh, man, I, I'm just so excited and just can't wait to see them tomorrow, you know, and, uh, you know, give them a hug and, and uh, you know, and go from there. I'll be headed to Ohio. Uh, my father-in-law passed away. And uh, uh, so I'll, I'm, I'm going there, man, to, to be with him and my ex-wife's family and as well as as well as my family and and get to see my mom and spend time so so i'm, I'm just man it's just god's good and life is good and and man you two guys man i enjoyed the heck out of y'all this past weekend we've got big ups you know we don't start at some so we got to finish it so we got to get a line up of what games you're going to show up and what games you're going to be because our our fans are hungry you know our, our viewers are hungry and they want to see some HBCU football and all that good stuff. So, again, thank you, too. Uh, thank our, our fan base. And as I always say, man, when you think things ain't going right for you and you feel yourself at the end of the road, tie a knot. Hold on tight because ain't nobody bad like you.